So what I'm going to tell you about this evening relates to the welfare of our children and about a behavioral and neurological disorder that's on the rise in our society. And we're still trying to figure out what is the origin of that rise. And it's been a bit surprising because it's a set of disorders that for a long time were thought to be fundamentally inherited. And I think that simplistic idea is changing, and that's a bit of what I'm going to tell you about today. But in a bigger picture, if we step back and look at these issues, what I'm really talking about, of course, is genetics and environment and how the two interact to produce an outcome. But what we're really talking about is that our species is at a point in our history which is very interesting and very important. And where we are is where we have the capability to affect our environment, locally and globally. Events thousands and thousands of miles away can affect us. But our knowledge of the impact of those environmental changes is primitive indeed. And we better figure this out. Because part of the story I'm going to tell you about today is that environment does have a consequence on diseases that also have a large genetic component. But if we're going to do something to prevent these diseases, and prevention is the best medicine. It's always hard to put the genie back in the bottle. What we want to do is prevent the disease from ever arising, which means we have to understand its origins. So these are very important issues that we face. Now, I've chosen rather an unusual title, um, An Inconvenient Truth. And you might remember what the, where this title comes from. It actually comes from a 20, 2006 award-winning documentary film that featured the former Vice President Al Gore. And what he did was go around the country trying to make uh, people aware of the large amount of evidence that suggested that human activity can influence global climate. Now at that time in 2006, I think climatologists were already agreed that the indications were such that human activity could do this. The politicians were not. The community as a whole didn't, wasn't really aware of it, and so it was his objective to make everybody aware of it. And what he did really was challenge existing assumptions that human activity is large enough and significant enough to affect global climate. So it's really about assumptions, and that's why I chose this title. Now, of course, the, since 2006, eight years passed, a lot of the concerns that he expressed in that presentation, they've been borne out. But what really attracted me, that title, and why I've integrated into this, is because it's about assumptions. And what I'm telling you is there are some assumptions that the biomedical community has made about autism spectrum disorders and other diseases like it that I think are wrong. And they deserve, at the very least, some re-examination. OK, so let me take a step back from autism alone and talk about the impact of psychiatric and behavioral disorders in general. How big of a problem is it? How much of an effect does it have on our communities? Well, if we look globally, and I've taken some numbers from a 2011 report from the World Economic Forum, the global cost of mental illness, two and a half trillion. Now, that's a big number. Where is it relative to, for example, health spending globally, which was about 5.1 trillion? Now, of course, these costs, they come in many forms. That person doesn't work anymore. There's the cost of their treatment, the cost of disability. But let's just compare it, for example, to, so in the, in the US, 317 billion per year in the US. How does that compare to, let's say, cancer, which is a big and significant and important problem? In 2008, cancer costs were 200 billion. So this is a big number. It's a big number in terms of financial costs, and it's a big number in terms of human costs. Behavioral disorders and psychiatric disorders are as big a problem, maybe bigger, than some of the diseases that we all know about and our biomedical research community is approaching with everything they've got. Obviously, I'm making the argument that these disorders deserve and are worthy of the same attention. 
So let me tell you a little bit about this disorder that I'm kind of using as an example of a whole variety of disorders that behave the same way. So what is autism? Well, it's based on a clinical diagnosis only. There's no test you can take, no blood test, no DNA test that is going to ascertain it in even a majority of children. Okay? So it's a clinical test where you observe their behavior and make some assessments. And the behaviors that are different in these children are their social interactions, their language development, and sort of grouped into this category are repetitive and stereotyped behaviors. I can tell you the variability on these traits is really large. There are children who are labeled as autistic and they don't speak a single word. There are also children that have autism spectrum disorder and they're able to be in their classroom with their, with their fellow classmates at the same age. But these are, so there's a huge range in the severity of this disorder. Now, how common is it? Well, in the United States, back in 2002, the federal government set up a system to try and monitor the prevalence. And it was organized by the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, and they set up um, 14 sites across the country to just evaluate what is the prevalence, what is happening. Now, in 2008, one in 88 children was diagnosed with this disorder. Now, how does that compare to other time frames? Well, just literally a week or two ago, the 2010 data was released from that same group. One in 68 in just a two-year time period. How does that compare to when they started? Well, in 2002, it was one in 156. And during this time interval, our awareness of the disorder has not changed very much. The diagnostic criteria has not changed very much. It's very, very hard to argue that these changes in this time frame are due to reporting differences as opposed to real differences. What I'm going to argue, what I believe, is that these kinds of changes in such short time spans, they don't reflect ascertainment bias or different diagnostic criteria. They reflect real and true change in our population. But that's controversial. Depends on what field as to which side of that line you may take. So obviously, if the environment is contributing, that's one of the things you'd expect. You'd expect to see short time frame changes, and we are seeing them. OK, so what do we know about the other side of this? What do we know about the inheritance and the mechanisms of this disorder? Well, the history of this is very interesting. One of the ways to study that question is to ask, if you have identical twins, how concordant are they for that trait? In this case, the trait is, do they have autism? Right? So you're asking, if one twin has autism, what percentage of the time does the other identical twin have autism? If there's a large genetic component, they're going to be together a lot of the time. Right? More so than siblings, right? but siblings will be more than the general population. And those traits are found for this disorder. And the initial measurements from identical twins showed a very high, what we call, heritability. Namely, if one, if one twin gets it, so does the other. Saying that your DNA sequence, your genome structure, is what's dictating whether or not you have this disorder. Now, just recently, a very large, beautiful study came out of Sweden. A very large group of people included in this study. They were a bit more sophisticated in how they analyzed it, and they came up with a very important number. And that is that, in fact, the heritability, that is, the risk given to you from what you get in your genes, is about 50%. And environment is the other 50. That's a very important idea, and not widely accepted yet. But this data that just came from Sweden is going to do a lot to convince many of the geneticists who've been feeling, oh, it's 80 to 90%. Environment has a very little effect. So that's good news. The other thing I should say about it is that autism, it's not really a disease. It's many that we look at and clump. And why do we do that? Because as human beings, we're very, very sensitive to these qualities, social interaction and language. I mean, if I approach someone and I get into their physical space, we know that in our bones when that social interaction is being violated. 
right? That's a rule of the road that we're not. So our sensitivity to social interactions and language is very high because that's what we are as human beings. That makes us human beings. That doesn't mean mechanistically these are the same disorders. In other words, these are many, many different disorders that have certain recognizable features that we as human beings are extremely aware of. And so we put them into that box. That doesn't mean mechanistically they work that way. Now, from the genetics that's been done, and it's been quite a bit of it, it's one thing is clear. This is not 10 genes. It's not 50 genes. There are probably hundreds to thousands of genes that each can affect your susceptibility to this disease. So that's really putting another way what I just told you. It's not a single disease. Now, this is problematic. Because if you want to develop a drug to affect that change, and you have a thousand different targets, that is a big problem, right? I mean, cancer is a genetic disease, too, in a way. It's a disease of those cells which mutate so they grow wildly and uncontrollably. That is a tenfold simpler problem than behavioral issues. And, you, and we're making progress on drugs that go after specific deficits in cancer. But it's slow going. And this problem is 10 times, maybe 100 times more complicated. So that whole strategy that we can just say, oh, drug companies, please develop these drugs for all these different problems that we identify over time. I'm not sure that's really very realistic. So that's one of the assumptions that I'm talking about that I think deserves some reexamination. OK. So the other point I want to make about autism is it's an example of a complex disorder. What does that mean? It simply means it's not a single gene, but it does have genetics. And that is true for the vast majority of diseases in our society. That pattern of many, many genes, each of them having some effect. It's true for schizophrenia. It's true for heart disease. It's true for type 2 diabetes. In other words, Two-thirds of our healthcare costs are embedded within diseases that have genetics, but it's complicated genetics. It's many, many targets, many, many mechanisms. So the whole strategy of, oh, we've just got a few places that we have to manipulate the signaling in a cell with a drug, I don't think it's going to get us there. So we have to think about other things, and that's why the environment makes some sense. Right? If we can identify considerations or environmental influences that influence susceptibility, we can manipulate those. Right? So I think that's a value to consider. All right. So the truth is, as we approach autism as a disorder, how we do it and what works is not going to just apply to autism. It's going to apply to all these other disorders that are the result or that produce two-thirds of our cost of health care in North America. So as you probably know, you know, genetics and genomics has had a technical revolution in the last decade. We can now sequence the entirety of your genome. We can know every single bit of genetic information in your genome for about 4,000 bucks. And 10 years from now, it'll probably be less than 1,000, which means it's less than a CAT scan. All right? which means the DNA of patients is going to be a primary medical history component for just about everybody. All right? So the, is, the question is, is that information going to just lay itself out and tell us about all the origins and problems of our susceptibility to kidney disease, heart disease, whatever, Alzheimer's disease? Can we identify susceptibility to Alzheimer's in someone who's just been born and do things as they progress through life to help them so they never get Alzheimer's disease, possibly. So the promise is this, is does a detailed understanding of our genetics allow us to make predictions and prognoses and hopefully intervene before the disease even develops? And I think the answer to that is yes, but not so easily in every case. It's certainly happening for cancer treatment, as I've mentioned, but it's not going to help when you have a thousand different disease targets. And it's confounded by environment. So we have to think of those things. So what are the assumptions that the biomedical community makes as a whole when they consider this strategy of let's, let's get at the genes that influence susceptibility? The assumptions are these, that 
even complex diseases are going to have a modest number of targets that we can go after. And that we can manipulate those targets with a drug. And finally, that, they're, that what we inherit is the vast majority of the susceptibility to that disease. So two of these assumptions, as you've gathered, I'm calling into some question. The first one, we already know that autism is hundreds of genes. Okay? And we already know, and I'll show you some of the evidence, that it's not just genetics, it's environment too. And the interplay between genetics and environment. So two of these assumptions are iffy. Now, let me put this into perspective. The drugs that work against HIV AIDS, they target two molecules. So there are three drugs that are, most people that take these drugs, they take combinations of three. Two of the drugs usually target reverse transcriptase, which is the polymerase that allows the virus to replicate. And the, the second class of drugs is called protease inhibitors. And what they do is take the long proteins that are going to be make, go into making the viral capsid itself, and the protease snips it into the appropriate parts so they can be assembled. Now, it, it took decades, right, to get those drugs. And they work pretty well. I mean, right, the, the hospitals in San Francisco and major cities, all, they, once those three drugs were in place, people got better. And people live with HIV AIDS now. Right? They live with it. But that was two targets, okay? Just perspective. Two targets. We're talking about thousands of targets, all right? And every drug has a side effect. There's no such thing as a drug that does exactly this and none of the things that you don't want. They don't exist. So you see the problem. Okay. So what role do environmental factors play in this? What's the data? I'm going to give you some of it. So one thing for which there's very good data are an environmental factor that actually protects people from autism. And that's vitamin supplementation. And the important element of that appears to be folate supplementation. So moms that take those vitamins before and you know, around the time of pregnancy, they reduce the incidence of autism by half. Okay? So it's 2x protective. All right? The other, the other environmental factor that we know works the other way, that increases your susceptibility, is exposure to certain environmental air pollutants. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. That's about a twofold risk as well. In the other direction, increased risk. And the other thing I should say is, you know, autism is a developmental disease, right? It's a disease of development. And we have model organisms that we study these things all the time, mice even fruit flies. And for traits that require many, many genes, in just about every case, the model organisms are telling us environment plays a huge role. And the interactions between more than one genetic variant play a huge role. Those lessons are going to apply to us, too. OK. So I want to touch on a couple other environmental factors that have come of re to note recently. And this is a study from my colleagues at the at University of California, Davis. And they've looked at the contribution of metabolic disorders, so diabetes, hypertension. And this is a big table, and I don't want to belabor it too much, except I want to point out a couple things. So ASD is autoimmune disorder. DD, that column, represents developmental delay. So they have their slow and reaching developmental milestones, but they don't have the communication and, and socialization problems that we see in children with autism. And the TD column is typically developing. So that's the control group. And the bottom line is that if you sum up all these metabolic disorders, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, the risk is about 1.6 increased. Okay? That's the increased risk of autism in those mothers. And for developmental delay, it's even a little bit higher. So what does this say? This says that hypertension, obesity, the changes in our diet, they don't just affect that mom. They affect their children. They affect the risk of developmental delay in autism. Another paper that just came out very recently relates to autism risk and proximity to pesticide-treated fields. And again, this data say about a 1.7-fold risk if you're within a mile of these fields that get treated with pesticides. This is early days in this field, but um, the data are of some concern. Okay, 
One other point I want to make, the ability to predict who's going to get this disorder, it's not just an academic exercise, because we do know one thing, what interventions that we have that are effective, the earlier you implement them, the more positive effect you get. Most children right now are diagnosed about age four. We know we can accurately diagnose them at age two or less. And the sooner we get them into behavioral intervention programs, the better they do. And there's hard data that shows this is the case. So early identification, getting these children into treatment, it's key. Right? So it's not just an academic exercise trying to determine who has susceptibility and who doesn't. So this is some of the data that supports what I've just told you. There's very good evidence that early intervention, it even affects you know, things that you can see in, in EEG scans of brains, um, as well as behavioral tests. So there's very good data that early intervention works. OK, so what are the lessons from all this so far? Well, first of all, if you do the best genetic tests we have on these children, you can only find something that is likely to be contributing to autism in maybe 10 to 15 percent of the cases with the best technology. So there's a lot we still have to explain. We know from that that the genetic target is large, hundreds to thousands of genes. And we know that it's really not one disorder, it's many. And the phenotypes are highly variable. And I should also say they're not unique to autism. So the same genes that are coming up for susceptibility to autism, they're coming up for susceptibility to schizophrenia. Okay? And the bottom line is, if you disrupt the development of their brain, guess where you're going to see it first? Behavior. Behavior, behavior, behavior. Okay? So there's going to be common mechanisms because, the truth be told, schizophrenia is not one disease either. There have been hundreds of thousands of people for which genetic testing has been done. You know how much of the variants we can explain in schizophrenia? 6%. 6%. Okay? It's a very complicated disease. The bottom line is the brain is a very complicated thing. And there are lots of different ways you can mess it up and you get all kinds of different behavioral disruptions. Okay? So, now. My lab has been interested in a question that is really embedded within all these things I've been telling you, which is, when you have a phenotype, in this case, we're calling it autism spectrum disorders, how much of it is from genetics alone, environment alone, and then how much of it is a third component, which is the interactions between more than one genetic variant and the interaction between environment and those genetic variants. And I wanted real numbers for this, not hand-waving, but real numbers. And to get at real numbers, to determine the relative contributions of each of those things, you have to do the study, genetics and environment, on the same group of kids. Now, in this field, there are the epidemiologists who do the numbers of exposure to various types of environmental things. And so they do the tracking of exposures and risks and associations. And the geneticists, they get blood from these people and do DNA and all this kind of stuff, and they don't do any of this other stuff. So I've been saying, this doesn't make any sense. We should be applying genetic tools to the same group of children who are also being evaluated for environmental exposures so we can actually get real numbers on what are the relative contributions of these. So that's what we've done. And I'm just going to tell you one little snippet of some experiments we've done to address that to give you some idea of where it's going. So we did some genetics on a group of children from a California, a large California study, um, my collaborators at uh, University of California, Davis. And we looked at a type of genetic variation called copy number. And copy number is looking at small deletions or duplications in DNA. So if you think of the sequence of nucleotides of DNA as the book of life, which Clinton called it when the sequence was finished of the human genome, what I'm talking about is duplications of sentences, words, maybe even whole paragraphs, or deletions, or movement of it somewhere else, right? Not the change of one to something else, but deletions and duplications. So it's one type of genetic variation, not the only important one, but one type. So what we did is measure that in these kids, and we found that the kids with autism had more of it everywhere. 
And it was a gradation. In fact, you could say, oh, how much of these deletions and duplications did they have and how severe was their autism? There was a direct correlation. Which also speaks to how big the target is, right? If you've got a big target, thousands of genes, and you take lots of hits incrementally, you're going to have a gradation in how many hits and how bad off you are, right? Okay. So we had done genetics on this group of kids, and some env environmental people interested in exposure to air pollution had also evaluated those same kids, okay? But we, what we started was we converted this study where we're simply saying, is there a significant difference between the amount of this type of genetic variation in normal kids and children with autism? And there was. But we converted it to a you know, relative risk, that is, an odds ratio. What is the risk of having X amount of more of these deletions and duplications? And so that number is what I've shown here. It's about twofold. So for that genetic study, we're, we're measuring a certain limit amount of genetic variation, about a twofold risk of having a lot more duplications. Okay? And our collaborators had done the same thing with the same kids on some environmental exposures to air pollutants. And this is an abstract from their paper, and the bottom line is that it's also about twofold. Okay? The odds ratios are 1.98 for some of them. Okay? So they're fairly equivalent. But the fact that we had the data of this same group of kids of both allowed us to say, and what's the risk of the combinations? And that has been very hard to study. And here are the things that we were able to study and look at the interactions. So CNV stands for copy number variant, these small deletions or duplications. And we can classify them as such. Either their DUP is for dupes, right? And those are the environmental variables that we had um, available. Nitrogen dioxide levels, ozone, and particulate pollution, which comes a lot from diesel fuels and things like that. So, and I should add, this is ozone at ground level. This is not ozone in the stratosphere. Ozone in the stratosphere protects us from ionizing radiation. Ozone on the ground is from air pollution. And ozone is three oxygens. Very reactive little molecule. Not very good for you. Okay? So ozone in the, in the stratosphere is protective of us. It's part of our protection from the ionizing radiation from the sun. But Ozone down here on the ground is the result of chemistry, sunlight, energy, and pollution. Okay? Not good for you. So these were the things that we had to look at where we could test the interactions. And here is the model that we tested. So in one model, we'd say, okay, the phenotype, in this case autism and its severity, is a function of the genetic change of the environmental factor, which is ENV, and there's another factor, the interplay between them. That's the model that we're testing. The reduced model is, no, 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 that interaction is not significant. It's just additive. You got the genetics, and you have the environment, and the two added together, that's what you got. Okay? And so you can test this with statistical methods and modeling and say, which explains the outcome best? And we were able to test that for all those different interactions, and we got one that was off the charts. And that was the interaction between duplications and ozone. Now this is a fairly small sample size. I didn't actually expect we'd get anything. I was just doing the study to <laughs> sniff, you know, to see if there were some relationships there that were worth study with more kids. This is like 350 children. I wish there was 3,500 children in the study. But it was sort of a pilot. But in that first pass, we got something that was really remarkable. The p-value means what are the odds that that would occur by chance. Okay? And so what, the, what I'm trying to tell you is the interaction between ozone and copy number is big. It's not just that they are on their own, but the interaction is important. And this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. I'm not talking about ozone that's good for us. I'm talking about the ozone at ground level that's not so good for us. Okay. So let me give you the relative numbers. So this shows you the effect of the genetic change and ozone on its own actually doesn't do very much. On its own, ozone is not a risk factor, really. But the two together, the interaction alone is 2.7 fold. That's big. Now, the reason I was excited about this result was not because 
in and of itself it's going to explain anything, but it, for the first time we actually can say what is the relative contribution of genetics and environment and the interaction. And the first pass through says, guess what? The interaction is big. And that means you cannot ignore the environment. Cannot, cannot, cannot ignore it. Okay. So, now I'm going to show you the data without any statistics or blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to show you a table. And this is a table showing these kids, and I've divided them into quarters. You know, from the lowest level of ozone exposure, that lowest 25%, up to the top 25%. And likewise, for this copy number variation, how many deletions and duplications they have, that's also divided into quarters. And how many kids with autism are in each one of those little boxes? So this is the box with the lowest exposure of ozone and the least amount of genetic variation. And the incidence is 8 out of 100. And this is the box with the highest amount of ozone exposure and the greatest amount of genetic change, and the incidence is 82 out of 100. So I just show you these data to show what does a 2.78 or 6.8-fold difference mean in terms of incidence. So between the lowest quartile and the highest, it's a 10-fold difference. That's a difference that counts, right? That's a difference that says, well, maybe we should be monitoring ozone levels in our cities. Okay. So what I think we've done or we've attempted to do is put real numbers on these effects and their magnitude. And I think what it does is it shows that environment is certainly an important modifier of genetic risk. So environmental factors have risks on their own, independent of genetics, and so do genetic contributions. But there's also a very important interplay between them. And that emphasizes the point that we have to pay attention to environment if we're going to understand these disorders and identify who might be at risk. Okay, so let me go back and review those assumptions I was telling you about. What are the assumptions that we're working on? Well, complex disease is a modest number of genes. Mm, not really. Um, the vast majority of the disease severity is dictated strictly by the genetics. Mm, not really. The only assumption that sort of holds is that if you do find targets, we're pretty adept at making molecules that eventually can become drugs, but you know, it's also a 15-year process. All right. So two of these assumptions, I think, are questionable in practical terms. And we need to be practical about this because the incidence keeps going up. Okay, so what's the path forward? How do we go from genetic information shown in that double helix to pills that can solve the problem? Well, we might be able to not be able to do that. And what I'm arguing is, should we do genetics? Yes, we should. It's not that this information is pointless, but we need to look at interactions between genes, and most importantly, we need to consider this. We need to consider all the consequences of these things. Pesticide exposure, type 2 diabetes, folate supplementation. You know, there are many, and this is just a handful of things that have been studied. This is very expensive science, I'm telling you. You go out there and find out, well, what did, what did you get exposed to in your first trimester? What did you get exposed to in the second trimester? And this is not cheap, because you have to do interviews of patients, et cetera. It's really very um, expensive and time-consuming science, but it is of great value. So the bottom line I'm, is that, you know, this is where we live. This is one sphere. And this is on another sphere. And what we're coming to appreciate more and more, of course, is that we influence that sphere. We have the capacity to change our environment in very dramatic ways, some of which we don't really understand the implications. And what I'm also telling you is that environment that we induce, that we create, it has an effect on us. And I think Geneticists and epidemiologists and all these people, they need to work together to figure out this loop because that's where we're going to be able to have an impact on decreasing the incidence of these disorders. And it's not just autism, it's schizophrenia, it's type 2 diabetes, you name it. They all fall into this type of category. So in the end, right, we're all talking about what? We're talking about family. That's some of mine. It's all about family in the end and protecting it, and we need to think about our local family, and we need to think about our global family as well. And with that, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you.